I'm off to Singapore to look at its biophilic building. What's that? Biophilic cities, according to Tim Beatley in his fabulous book, is about bringing nature into the daily life of ordinary city dwellers, which means you have to build it into the way you build the city. And that is new because there's a whole lot of new techniques and technologies with green roofs and green walls and green edges. And we are trying to find the innovative edge in this area. And I think it's Singapore. Now I had to convince Tim Beatley to come with me and I'd really sold Singapore. So he's coming for a week. We have to check out a whole lot of case studies, meet a lot of people, do some interviews. It's gonna be very intense and we hope to have a sense of whether Singapore really is the biophilic city of the future. We've got a bit of help. Some of my students, in fact, 35 students from the National University of Singapore who are studying a master's in urban design uh, and they're doing a course with me and Tim are going to help us. And this combination, we hope, will unfold the secrets and mysteries and wonders of Singapore as a biophilic city. I mean, the ideal thing would be not just sitting in a garden, but sitting in a forest. And that would be like the aspirational thing that we want to do, you know. I was actually uh, inspired by uh, the St. Paul's in Notre Dame, uh, Gothic uh, architecture, with the, the amount, kind of, the, the grand space that they have. Loving plants is, is the most important thing that, I, that everyone has to do, because if you don't love plants, this is going to be the end of civilization. <laughs> I think the most proud aspect of this project is that I'm doing a difference to the patients in creating a healing environment for them. <laughs> oh, of course, that is the main purpose. I mean, to get people close to nature. Well, we're here at one of the tree canopy walks. It's part of the city's park collector system that connects the different parks in the city. And people are here on a Sunday and very interesting noises all around us. Uh, some of them are hammers and human-made no noises, but there's also beautiful cicada in the background and, and bird sounds and, and uh, the sound of a city with nature and lots of human things going on as well. The park's connectors, that seems like a very unique, special thing that you've done here. Cities naturally um, have fragmented um, natural areas. And therefore, we take great pains in trying, not pains, sorry, great efforts in trying to connect our um, natural areas so that our native biodiversity then can use an area much larger. Um, and so we do it by multiple ways and different layering. Years ago, when we, uh, when we started a greening program, one of the key things that we want to bring back were actually birds. And so Chris Hales actually started this idea of um, green corridors. And that idea grew and we started the Park Connectors Network. The Park Connectors Network connect wildlife, connect people. So they connect parks to parks, it connects uh, residential areas to parks, and they just ramify into different loops all around. So now we have more than 150 or so kilometers of park connectors. And by the end of it all, we hope to get about over 300 kilometers of park connectors. It's so accessible because that's the other important thing, that if things are accessible, then people will use it. So I think the park connectors are a wonderful way of uh, ensuring healthy lifestyle, uh, healthy biophilia as well as you know uh, connecting the practical side of things and that's connecting uh, destinations. Uh, Lena, uh, say again a little bit about the, the strategy that, that Singapore has taken to try to connect different layers of green and, and different green elements in the city. Okay, we have adopted a multi-pronged approach. 
So first of all, we have a green network of uh, roads. And so one of the ways that we've used is have a diversity of different layers of uh, trees. It's not just tall trees, but we also have uh, medium-sized trees and then uh, shrubs. And so it, it, it caters to all different uh, size of animals, different kinds of animals. Then the next step will be then you connect one uh, roadside planting to another roadside planting and that's the canopy that they then form that lovely overarching canopy. But at the same time it's not just the natural elements that we're using, we're also using the buildings because the buildings uh, are all around us. Our, our high-rise buildings, rooftop, you would actually have not just plant a turf but also have water features so that you can have dragonflies and at the same time you could actually have small trees and each of the roofs can, can then can actually connect with another roof. We also connect at different altitudinal levels. It's just equity amongst animals that you actually provide these connection for all different animals. That's great. So, so you, this is a matter of explicit it's a, it's a, strategy it's a, that you yes, have. These that you just yeah, yes, altitude. Now, the, the, with with the plants, definitely because we wanted to emulate emulate that of a forest. I mean, the ideal thing would be not just city in a garden, but city in a forest. So, have you been successful in, in uh, pr pr preserving biodiversity in Singapore? Well, we have a monitoring tool that we have developed. And this monitoring tool is the uh, Singapore Index on Cities Biodiversity or the City Biodiversity Index. And um, it's, it's an important tool because we think that um, doing things is fine, but we need to then find out, are we doing it right or not? And there are more than 70 cities now around the world that have um, implemented in one way or another. So similarly for Singapore, we use key performance indicators as such. And similarly, these indicators help us measure, are we doing the right thing? Are, is our biodiversity improving? And um, hopefully in a few years' time, we will show that there's really uh, that kind of uh, results. At the present moment, we do see more animals, more you know, birds around, and, and, and greater diversity of species. Yeah. You're a very dense and growing city. It would seem you have some real challenges in protecting and, and restoring the nature you have here. Yes, indeed, we do have challenges. And how do we go about it? We try and look at it from a solutions approach. So what we do is that, first of all, the key thing is to keep ecosystems. And I think that's very important. So for us, if the ecosystems are not there, the species can't survive. And second then, we also take the, the species approach. There are some species that we think we need to actually help and give them a little boost. Because what we do about plants is that we're trying to up the conservation status. Like for example, you have endangered species, we actually go out, look for these endangered species, bring them back, put yeah. it in a nursery, plant them Probably and then plant them, them out. Well, we're here at, uh, at the Hort Park in Singapore and we're looking at these um, eight panels of green walls. They're a demonstration and research project of in parks and each of the walls is demonstrating a different green wall technology, different materials, different structure, different um, a set of plants. Here we have plastic boxes with a, a series of a little watering tubes to each box and, and dripping and draining. And so they're looking at them, testing them, evaluating them over the long term to see which ones, which systems seem to work the best and in which uh, environment. Initially, this building was uh, 10 storey high and it extended to 14. Because of the new floors, there were four columns added, these massive columns. They were really, really big and bulky elements, two of them in the middle. And then the other two at the ends, I've converted them and, and integrated them as part of the, the green wall. And the planters, horizontally, they've become the hanging garden. So as you can see, this is exactly just about a year after completion and the plants are really looking like a, a hanging garden as intended. So this is on level three we are on, and it goes up to level nine. So from level three to level nine, that's the six to seven floors uh, of offices overlooking into this atrium space. This whole space is treated as an external uh, space with a natural ventilation. 
meaning we don't need sprinklers, we don't need sp smoke extraction fans. And because of this, uh, it has to be naturally ventilated. Uh, the previous design was a mesh facade to get, uh, to get the ventilation through. Uh, what, what I did was I replaced it with glass and it was actually rejected by the fire authority because glass is simply not a permeable material. And what I did was I, I layered it by stepping it 900 millimeters, about nearly three feet apart, and gives the, uh, the, the, cross vent, uh, the ventilation into the atrium space. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the experience you had when you maybe unveiled this idea. What, how the project started off was the client wanted to replace the facade, and the client said, Calvin, why don't you have a look and see what you can do to the interior because it was dark and dingy, it was grey and it was, had all the mesh over it and it just looked pretty enclosed. It's a bit like a prison cell in a way. It's really, really unfriendly and uninviting. There was just two key words that I, I, I used. I, I wanted to make this lively, meaning it wasn't pleasant and people were you know, turning their, back, their backs onto this space. So I want to make it lively, that's one. The second one was to green this space so that it's, it, it has the, the, the sort of softness to it. Does that affect the rents at all? <laughs> are, they, are they being asked to pay more? Uh, well, I, I can't... The, the, the rent actually went up, you know, um, uh, partly due to the economy and partly it's, 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 a, it's a significant improvement to it. So I, but I can't tell, apportion it, how much is due to this. Before the renovation, out of the uh, six floors that faces the atrium, only one floor was let out, and the floor that was let out actually did not actually turn its back onto this space. It was actually facing the other side. But when it's finished, they, they extended their office and actually look into the, the, the hanging garden atrium. And I'm pleased to say that all the floors now have been let within a year. Yeah. And the vegetation? Is it some, is there, was there something special that you were trying to do with? the kinds of plants? They are on individual potted systems, about 6 inch cube, 150 cube, and uh, they are on auto uh, irrigation system. So it's individually it's dripped onto th almost 13,000 pots of plants in here. The good thing about this system is that it is individually potted, which aesthetically you can hardly see the pots now, uh, even when it was first completed. Uh, the, 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 my main concern was the, uh, the well-being of the plants and should any of them uh, doesn't survive or, or, or doesn't look too healthy, they can be easily uh, individually changed and replaced or, 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 or maintained. Uh, so this is what I'm, I, the first priority that I wanted. All you do is you just turn sideways and okay. you slip, slip, slip in. <laughs> This is the, uh, the, the inside of the green wall uh, behind it where maintenance uh, access is provided. It's, it's, as I've mentioned, these are all individual pots and uh, they are all on the, uh, simply clip onto some frames and then onto this, the, the metal structure. Shortly after it was completed, can't see any today, but there have been birds, uh, butterflies and, and dragonflies that stream through here. In fact, up on the highest uh, planter, on level nine, there was a bird nest that was discovered and there was a, a little baby bird that we found. Uh, unfortunately, because it's a commercial building, they have to <laughs> remove it. <laughs> uh, and what happens is, is you look down onto the glass floor, it, it, it visually it, it connects you back to the pavement and the road Street. level. Yeah. And uh, I was actually uh, inspired by uh, the St. Paul's in Notre Dame. Uh, Gothic uh, architecture with the, the amount, kind of the, the grand space that they have. So when I saw this, I, I said that we must have the glass floor here. So when you look up, you get this cathedral of green above your head. Cathedral and of green, that's terrific. Exactly. That's I primarily. A There's a bird, I see a bird. Oh, yes, yes, there, yes, there, yes, there, yes, yes, there's a bird. Yep. Yep. We have a bird. Are there any government incentives, any, anything uh, that helped to, to make this possible? Yes, in Singapore, the, the end parks, the national parks, uh, which is in charge of all the greenery planting in, in, in Singapore, they have uh, a Skyrise Greenery Incentive Scheme, uh, and it actually has got fairly good funding. Um, uh, I hope with uh, 
158 Cecil Street, we, we will be able to uh, uh, get more people uh, to be more open and receptive towards having green walls in, 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 in a major scale. The, the, the fascinating thing about this building, even now a year after uh, has been finished, each time I come back I bring my camera along because it changes and, and, and you see things that are new. So it's, 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 it's a living wall. First one you've done? This it's, your first, it's my first project. Your first yeah, green my wall? first green wall. I my heard. first project since I came out into practice on really? my own. We started with the green roof program for six months and we realized that, that there's a um, interest for people to extend the, the coverage to walls, green walls. Because the main reason why we started this greenery program is to reduce the effects of uh, urban heat island. And we did a scan of the industry to uh, find out what's the cost for you know, a basic extensive green roof. Uh, it costs uh, 209, about $150 per square meter. But uh, since then, I think the price has gone down to about $100. The incentive scheme reimburses half the installation costs, which means that uh, we reimburse up to a limit of $75 per square meter. That has been seen very encouraging response. Um, from then until now, we have uh, 55 buildings all over Singapore uh, under the scheme. Now, new buildings, uh, building owners, developers are beginning to see the value in uh, planning you know, their new building suite this green rooftops and the vertical walls. But first, first and foremost, uh, I must point out that this is a hospital. Our job is to save life. But having built that hospital with all those technology and all those stuff that we need to look after the patient, we then try to wrap it up okay, to create a healing environment. And uh, in fact, uh, we spec it to the architect that we want a place where when you step in here, your blood pressure and your heart rate will go down. Can you describe a little bit in more, a little bit more detail what are the, the natural elements of the, of the hospital? Actually, the space we have is not all that large. It's 3.4 hectares. All right? And our build-up area is actually 110,000 square meters. So this is a sizable building on a fairly small plot of land. Uh, we try to create the, the sense of spaciousness and the comfort in this area by bringing green uh, right into the heart of this building. So right from the entrance of the hospital, when you're in the driveway there, and all the way through uh, to this level, basin one, and then level one, and then to the pond. It's just open space, okay? Uh, it's, it's to create a sense of spaciousness. And of course, uh, we are also in a tropical environment where it is hot and humid. Uh, and we wanted to have airflow right across the building. So this is the, the basic concept that the greenery is brought in as an integral part of this whole planning. Now, for patients, when they are not well, they are uncomfortable and sometimes they have to spend considerable amount of time uh, in the inpatient ward in the ICU or even when they come to the clinics, they will be spending a bit of time waiting. So we try to give them an outdoor view with the greenery, the skies and, and hopefully some birds flying by and butterflies flying around. Just sort of distract and also comfort them. What can you say about the biodiversity in, the, in this hospital? Um, our Urban Renewal Authority, URA, which is the chief planning uh, department of the country, uh, they have a, a very nice slogan, make Singapore a great place to live, work and play. And I've decided to corrupt that, that statement. And I said, let's make Singapore a great place to live, work and play for men and flora and fauna of the tropical rainforest. All right. So we say we can have the cake and eat it. Uh, why design a place and have a place only for ourselves? We could share it around, all right? And so we decided part of this project is that we're going to let, the, first of all, we let the plant survive first, okay? Because plant is the source of life, really, right? So we planted uh, mostly the indigenous trees and plants, all right? Uh, and then we say that we would like to have the birds here, we like to have the butterflies here, and so on. So the, the different nature level came in and they give their, their two cents worth, you know? If you do that, the butterfly will come. If you do that, the birds will come, and so on. So this is how this, this concept evolved. It's for us, the patients, the hospital staff, visitors, and also for the flora and fauna all right, of, the, of the, this region. All right. And what, what do you know about the, the effects on patients, the healing aspects of the, of 
all, all these green features. Are... I think when the patients come to the hospital, they, they didn't expect this. I mean, but the, the feedback we have been getting has been almost 100% you know, positive, and I think people, people love this place. In fact, what we are seeing is that uh, lots of people are coming here and, and uh, they have no reason to be in the hospital, basically. You know, they're they are not here for, as a patient or visiting a patient. But they are coming here to, to enjoy the garden and to look at the fishes and, and stuff like that. And lots of people are carrying camera around, taking photographs. And students are coming by here to study. So, and the thing is, it's totally occupied. This day, yeah. We intended it to be. In, in our mind, the level one and uh, basement one of this hospital, right all the way to the waterfront, is actually meant to be a communal garden. Okay, it's meant for the, the, the neighborhood, the people to come by here and relax and enjoy. All right. Uh, we are very conscious that this is a public hospital. We don't own this hospital. And this is public space built with public money. And uh, we should maximize the utility of this whole space. So this project is really one project where uh, we let it flow. All right? It's sort of uh, over the period of planning and, and construction, uh, things just evolved. And what you see here is the creations of many. I'm with CPG Consultants. I've been involved since the design competition stage back in 05 and I saw through the project to completion in 2010. What are you proudest about uh, here? Well, I, yeah, I think the most proud aspect of this project is that I'm doing a difference to the patients in creating a healing environment for them. I think that's the most important aspect. Yes, because this is, in, this is a hospital. You see? So it's not just about creating a communal spaces. Of course, that is important. But what is most important is how it makes a difference to the patients. And I think we have done that whether you are a subsidized patient or you are a private patient, you have a fantastic environment to recover. Is that something you learn in architecture school? Have architects <laughs> always been thinking about uh, healing spaces? And no, healing no, points? definitely not, definitely not. I mean, frankly, this is my first hospital project. Okay, before this, I was working on a park project about nature conservation. So there were some learning points brought from that project to this project. But again, it's a very different brief. That's a park, this is a hospital. We're very heavy loaded on technology, on functionality, but with an additional twist to it, this additional requirement, okay, for a green hospital. So it's sort of like, you know, merging the best of many different aspects of architectural design. Not something you can learn in architecture school. <laughs> And will this, will this uh, project then change the way other hospitals are, are designed, other health uh, facilities in Singapore? In definitely, definitely. I mean, this has become a benchmark in the local context and even for the region. I mean, you have a lot of visitors coming to see this hospital and learning from it. Of course, we are also looking at other people, you know, how other people are doing it. Because this is not perfect, but we, I think we have set a benchmark. And for example, the next hospital that's being built now in Jurong, has incorporated some of the features, for example, rooftop gardening terracing, you know, bringing a view out to the patients. That has been translated to other projects. And I think looking ahead, okay, for example, Yishun Community Hospital, Sengkang General Hospital that's coming up, it's all going to have a bit of this. Can you, uh, first of all, tell us who you are? I know you've been described as uh, the chief gardener here at the hospital. Is that a real title? I coordinate the garden in the whole hospital actually and uh, the rooftop is only one aspect of it. Our aim of doing the rooftop is three things. We want to engage the community to come and take part and be useful to socialize and we want to have a food chain because food is getting more expensive and we're having organic which is even better and to give produce for the kitchen any extras we will sell to staff or the public and the money goes into the green fund to support all the, our green activities here. Also, we want to make use of the... Here is a solar panel. And why waste the land? So we maximise the land to grow our produce. And since then, for one and a half years, we have had harvest after harvest. The produce have been very good. You're in charge of all of the gardens. I'm in charge of the healing environment and the biodiversity. So um, we started here with only three butterflies. So far, we are very successful in getting 35 butterflies uh, to date, and we are still counting. 
we are also bringing in birds. We, we on purpose plant trees that will attract birds. Hopefully to bring in 100 species of birds and the fishes. We have a, a lot of water features here and uh, all these are Southeast Asian fishes. So far we have managed to get 192 species so far. We want to actually um, bring back the, the species that are getting extinct. We also open our garden to schools. They come and do what we call their community involvement program. So they come here and learn about gardening, to learn to get their hands dirty, because many of them are on computer and hardly even touch soil. So we want to start to educate the young so that they'll be future, our future greenies. You know. People like to work here? Actually, many Not staff, I was told, they pick here because they like the environment. They like the, 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 the ambience. And they said that, you know, they feel working in a place like this is better than working in town where you are faced with four walls. People always ask me, did you, did you design this? Did you have a, did you have a plan? Uh, did you have, did you, like what Patrick Blanc does, he actually has a piece of paper and then he, he, he says, okay, certain, certain plan has to be here. This certain plant has to be here, and then he gives it to some contractors, and then they they would plant it. But we it wasn't planned. We just took the plants and just we just put it in, and and it just came naturally. Okay, this plant would look nice here. This plant would look nice there. It's just like art, you know. You got a blank canvas, and you just, you start drawing, and that's what we did. Well, what's great about this is this is a, a low cost wall that you you've done with, yeah. with your students. In any school, um, money is a problem. Right, if you want to make something, um, budget is an issue. And what NPAX was offering was they were going to give us 50% of the amount of uh, any wall that we built. Um, but the problem was getting that amount of money as well. Because if we employed any contractor, right, uh, any wall of this size would have cost us at about coming to about 40,000, 40 to 50,000. So we, we had to find ways to, to do it cheap. and. So we, 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 went up, we went to the net, we found things done by Patrick Blanc quite interesting. It, it looks very impressive uh, and I personally saw it because I went to London, I went to Paris and I, I saw his work and uh, I actually went to touch it, <laughs> touch the felt. And uh, actually if you, if you looked at it, our felt is quite strong. His felt is really soft and, and, and they're growing. Our, we didn't take any risk, our felt is quite uh, robust. Then we made a prototype. There's a prototype at the back. We put it up uh, and we let it grow for about two, three months. We saw it was working and we decided, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. We couldn't, of course, build the boards for this entire wall. That would take a lot of manpower. So we, en we uh, employed a contractor. So they fixed the boards up for us and they stapled the PVC felt onto the boards for us. Then after we went to the nursery, uh, chose the plants that we wanted. Uh, brought them to school uh, from the nursery and then we, we put it up on our own. Yeah, uh, All we needed was a, 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 a very strong stapler. <laughs> yeah. You insert the plant? Insert the plant because you, you, cut, you cut slots into the, the felt and then you insert the plant in and then yeah, you and staple, staple yeah, so you staple around it so that it, 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 the plant is in place. And the students did yeah. stapling? Yeah, uh, students helped in stapling, depotting. Uh, like I said, there's only two teachers, so you, 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 need, you need a number of students to help you uh, because it's uh, very labor intensive. Uh, it took us um, many days <laughs> to, to actually do this. Yeah, uh, and for over, over a period of about three, four weeks. Three, four weeks. Yeah, to, to actually complete the wall. And then you, you have you've designed your own irrigation. Well, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, actually. It's just, it's just a tube at the top. Right, and then you have water coming down, you know, it's gravity does everything for you, so it's nothing to design, you know. Plants grow, you, you give it everything that it needs, sunlight, water, air's all around you, so it's going to grow. Yeah, nutrients has to be provided. The system that we have, it will give in uh, this amount of nutrients to the water supply. Yeah, it, it mixes it up for you automatically. But I try not to add in too much. I actually add in uh, maybe once in three months because when every time I add, the, it gets really bushy and crazy, yeah. So I, I would prefer that it, it, slows, it grows slowly, actually. <laughs> it's just growing a bit too fast. 
our total cost uh, for this wall was about uh, 15,015. Uh, um, and NPAX gave us half of that, about 8,000. Yeah. Still, the remainder of that money, where, where did that come from? The remainder of the money came from the school. Uh, well, 7,000 is not a lot of money. Uh, manageable. What yes. made you think you could do this? <laughs> I don't know. You just decided? <laughs> it's all inspiration, actually. When I saw what Patrick Blanc did, Paris, and, and I saw the, I saw how huge the wall was. And, and, and I thought, hey, it's possible to be done, and it's so simple. And, uh, and I thought, hey, why not just try doing it? And, and I just went ahead and did it. <laughs> Do you use the, the wall in any classes? One topic is environment. So we show them how plants can actually uh, reduce temperature. Uh, so this is one way that we, we uh, show them how to. Like we show them the difference in temperature between this classroom and the classroom above. Because these two classrooms get direct sunlight uh, most, most times of the day. Uh, not right now, but later on you'll, uh, you'll see there's direct sunlight and it can get really hot. So if you can, they can compare the temperatures using uh, probes, uh, sensors, and they can tell that the classroom on the top would actually be, temperature would be much higher than the classroom below. <laughs> yeah. What, what's the impact later in life? Yeah, because that, that is something I'm very concerned about because you, if you look around you, it's rapid urbanization all around you, you know, and if, if these, these kids are not exposed to what their fathers or their grandfathers were exposed to, because most of them used uh, to live in a landed environment where they were exposed to a lot of greenery. But kids today, they live in flats, you know, with very little greenery. They're not exposed to this. And that's why we try to make our surrounding in the school where they spend the most of their time with this diversity of, uh, of plants so that they are aware that there's such beautiful things exist, <laughs> you know, and, and so that it doesn't die away, this generation of people who love plants doesn't die away because loving plants is, is the most important thing that, I, that everyone has to do because if you don't love plants, this is going to be the end of civilization. <laughs>
If we open that water, make it wider, have more biodiversity, bringing functions like cleansing systems into that, and slowing down the water process to harvest stormwater finally in the Marina Barrage, which is very important for Singapore as a water supply for drinking water. I knew at the same moment that this is an old park and it needs a facelifting. So I did a workshop actually very close by, which is actually just over there in a, in a little shed. And we did invest a week, my team did just invest a week of work. We invited local people, also people from different agencies. And we came up at the end of the week with a vision about bringing the two things together, restoration of the river, and facelifting and upgrading and making that to a modern uh, park. So by the end of that week, I could present this to the two CEOs from N Parks and PUB. And they luckily took this idea and agreed upon to do a joint project. I think the, the focus on this project is really to bring the green and the blue together. The green is the park, the blue is the water and to get it out of the gray and recycle the gray. Bring the gray to a point where we recycle like cradle to cradle using the old stuff of concrete and creating it to stabilize uh, the riverbank, to bring bioengineering in that. And then finally to bring the river as part of the park uh, together and saying the park is also part of the river system. So instead of having a sort of controlled area where we say this is a river and this is a park we actually overlap and this is a big challenge because it means you have to overlap finances you have to overlap management you have to overlap finally also maintenance questions you know and responsibility questions so what you see here is now today is very calm so uh, we don't have any big storm event at the moment but you can probably expect it might change in uh, two or three hours there might be thunderstorms coming down in Singapore in the afternoon. You have suddenly a lot of water coming downhill and actually out of this huge urban settlements around here. So everywhere where you see little holes like the one here in the back, there would be a lot of water coming in and this would fill up with water and we would suddenly have the water coming up in the worst case, actually as high as you see the red uh, little um, uh, sign post over there. That's how high the water can be. Uh, there is a warning system that we have blinking light like you can see over there. There is just a, a test run. There are warnings like uh, people with loudspeaker in many different languages in English and Mandarin and so on. They would hear this. Please step out of the water way of the river because the water might come up. Uh, finally, there is a warning system where all park rangers get a signal on their cell phones and then many other things in addition to that. So there's a safety was one of the very top issues. And you must imagine this is a real pilot project. It has never done in this scale in, uh, in the tropics. That is the main purpose. I mean, to get people close to nature and do it in a way that you really can enjoy and celebrate it. And I'll just show you a little example. Just have a look over there. We have uh, seating benches and this could be, especially in the evening when it's pleasant here, uh, hundreds of people sitting over there watching maybe uh, on a stage which is contemporary, which we can take away when there's water coming. There could be like an art performance a dance group or there could be a jazz band or there could be a local you know even a type of opera going on here and people are just sitting and enjoying in in the middle of the waterway but you can also imagine that kids come down play there we have stepping stones to cross over we have big biodiversity we uh, have a research a monitoring program going on which we do together with end parks we have seen a lot of species actually coming back. So from many sites, this is, turns out to be a success story. This is a very interesting topic, really a dense city where everything is artificial, where nature is completely sort of somewhere, but not here. It's imp extremely important to create uh, spaces and experience, a realm of experience for, for local people to see what nature can be. What is the dynamic of a river? What's the beauty? What is the function? 
So we will have a lot of education programs also going on. We have a number of schools around here. They can learn about it. And this is very important for a modern society, which is future oriented to learn firsthand what is natural process, what is sustainability, and how to bring function and lifestyle and aesthetics together. Even it's not open yet. There are a lot of people are attracted already. People speak about it. And I just know this new condominiums there, uh, the value of this uh, did go up. You know, it looks so easy, but this is really hard work, tough work. It's first of all uh, to think about new technologies, about how to do them, how to bring them here to the tropics. But even more important than all types of new technologies about uh, biodiversity, it was the main job of myself and my team to convince and to create confidence. Because our client is not trained or was not trained to uh, automatically believe you know, in new sustainability techniques and to in a sort of new approach about how to work with that, how to open it, what would happen. Uh, at this point we were confronted with fear and with horror scenarios. We had always to bring that which was very often a very abstract fear about what could happen if and we had to bring that down to reality and say look this is what is real this is how it would work let's do a try let's go step by step to build up confidence and to get finally the different agencies behind this project and to make it their child that was one of the biggest challenges on this project the next uh, sort of task we should really go for is to go in these regions, you know, where it is really narrow and where we have housing areas. How to treat water there so that finally the water which comes out on all these holes is already in a much better condition to bring better water quality down the stream. We have to do our homework already there. So we are hoping that this will be the start of many new steps. On the survey, the total number of birds is about 54, 54 species that has been surveyed along the transect, but the birds that interact with the water is about 17, 17 birds that actually go into the water or they feed around the water. So it's quite a good number considering that this is a very urban space. It's been a terrific week. We've been here in, in Singapore learning uh, about all the amazing things the city has been doing to, to incorporate nature uh, into its design and, and planning and building. And we've, we've had some pretty amazing visits with people and, and projects that show that even in a very vertical, dense uh, city like Singapore, uh, you can have a rich natural world. And it happens in, in lots of different places. It's the, the ground level reserve, it's the canopy that's all around us here along the, the streets, multiple layers. It's, it's on the rooftops of very high buildings and the facades of, of high buildings. And so here in Singapore, this is one very compelling model for how you can have the, the, the urban conditions, the density, and also the nature. No, I didn't, I, I didn't, I don't take instruction well, I didn't realize you were.